And please uh, take your copy of God's Word and turn with me to Genesis chapter 17. should be very easy for you to find. It's the first book of the Bible. Chapter 17. Last week, Jacob, from what I hear, did a wonderful job, I'm sure he did, um, opening up our Advent series called The Promised Christ. So that's why in the worship guide it says this is part two. Jacob opened us up last week, so thank him. I'm very thankful to him for filling in and preaching the Word of God. And so today we're going to continue on by looking at the Abrahamic Covenant. And I'll explain some more about our plan in just a moment. But if you would, please read this. Uh, follow along with me in Genesis chapter 17. We're going to read 1 to 14. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said to Abraham, as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male throughout your generations, whether born in your house or, brought with, or bought with your money from any foreigner who is not of your offspring, both he who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money shall surely be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh, an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this morning and this opportunity to look at the Abrahamic covenant. And Lord, there is just so much here. I just pray that you help me to be clear this morning. I pray that this would be helpful for us. I pray that this wouldn't just be a study, but that this would reap, uh, produce very uh, practical fruit in our lives for your glory and our good. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So today marks the first official Sunday of what is commonly referred to as Advent. Some of you are familiar with what Advent is, and some of you have no earthly idea what I'm talking about. Is that one of those calendars that has cheese and crackers that they sell at the store? Advent is the four Sundays before Christmas Day when Christians take some time to prepare their hearts for the great glory and joy that we celebrate on Christmas Day, which is the birth of the promised Christ. It's not a required season of observance, of course, you won't find it in Scripture, but it's more of a tradition that's handed down to us from church history with the desire to make this season, this Christmas season, as beneficial to our souls as possible. You know, people often remark about this time of year that this is uh, an especially busy time of year. There's Christmas parties, Christmas shopping, Christmas cookies, Christmas traditions, various family gatherings that people observe 
They fill our time. All of these things fill our time in such a way that's often spiritually draining, which is ironic because we say things like Jesus is the reason for the season. But isn't it such a battle to keep that at the forefront of your mind? Isn't it a battle in all of the busyness of the season to keep in view Christ in the glory of Christmas morning? That's why Advent is a great tradition. Because Advent helps us to slow down and to really think through what we are going to celebrate on December 25th. The word Advent simply means coming. So you'll hear people say, and we'll say this morning, the first advent of Christ. It just means the first coming of Christ. And then there's the second advent of Christ, which is what we are looking forward to, is the second coming of Christ. The people of God living under the old covenant were waiting for generations and generations for the first advent of the promised Christ who would come and set His people free from their bondage. And we, as the people of God living under the new covenant, enter into that same eager anticipation as we wait with hope for the second advent of the promised Christ. In this way, Advent is a season of hopeful waiting. But because we live in the benefits of Christ's first advent, we have the unique perspective of knowing that we do not wait or hope in vain. Just as Christ had been promised and God was faithful to send this promised Christ into the world the first time, though many generations had passed since the promise, that same God will be just as faithful in fulfilling the promise of the second advent. But not only that, just as God has been faithful in fulfilling all of those promises throughout history, He will continue to be faithful to all of the promises that He made to His people in all 66 books of the Holy Scripture. So what we're going to do over these four Sundays of Advent is to take some time to carefully think about how Christ's first advent is definitive proof of the unchanging faithfulness of God. The way that we're going to do that is by looking at a few of the major covenants in the Old Testament. Covenants that you've probably read, of, read before and just kind of glanced over thinking that's for Israel. We're going to look at the Abrahamic covenant, which is what we just read. Next week, we're going to look at the Mosaic covenant, how Christ fulfilled that. And then the Davidic covenant, covenant, how it is that Christ fulfilled that. We're going to see how nothing in all of human history has been able to thwart God's plan. And nothing anyone has ever done has ever affected the faithfulness of God. It might not seem like it, but studying these covenants and how Christ is the fulfillment of them will not only help you understand your Bible better, but it also in, has incredible practical benefits for your everyday life. So I want to keep that in view, brothers and sisters. We're not here just to do some you know, uh, abstract theological study. This is going to have real flesh and bone application for your everyday life. But you're going to have to wait till we get to the end to see it. I told you earlier this week to bring your thinking caps your page-turning fingers, so I hope that you have done that. We're going to study these three Old Testament covenants over the three next three weeks, and then on Christmas Eve, which is the fourth Sunday, we're going to complete this study of the promised Christ by looking at the new covenant that was inaugurated as a result of Christ's first advent. So, our roadmap for this morning is we're going to ask three questions, Okay. We're going to try to answer three questions. Number one, what is the Abrahamic covenant and what does it promise? Number two, how does Christ fulfill that covenant? Number three, and most practical for you, why does this matter? So that's our roadmap for us this morning. I'm going to go ahead and let you know 
We're going to spend the majority of our time answering the first question because like dominoes, after we answer that question, I think that you'll easily be able to answer question two and three. I pray that our study this morning is going to be as much of a blessing for you as it has been for me to prepare. So, what is the Abrahamic covenant and what does it promise? In order to, for us to understand this, we need to first understand what a covenant is. What is a covenant? I think what often comes into our mind when we hear the word covenant is a promise or a very serious promise, or something that they did in the Old Testament that doesn't really matter to us anymore. Now, there's certainly an element of promise in a covenant in that there is a commitment to do something, but a covenant goes beyond just a mere promise. Has anyone ever made a promise and then forgot that you made a promise? Yeah, you can't do that with covenants. That doesn't happen with a covenant. Now, I know I've said this a number of times and I said it this morning. Some of this is going to seem like either seminary level study or perhaps even just splitting hairs. But it's actually vitally important to understand covenants if we are to understand the Bible. Moreover, for our purposes, if we don't understand what a covenant is, we're not going to get a lot out of this Advent series and we don't want that now, do we? So covenants are essential to our Christian faith and to understanding the redemptive storyline of Scripture. God has revealed Himself to us as a covenant-keeping God, and He works throughout redemptive history through covenant. So let's try to define this all-important word. One theologian offers this helpful explanation of what a covenant is. He says, quote, A divine covenant consists of the legal and binding terms of a relationship with God. Since God is God, He sets the terms of the relationship. In other words, a divine covenant is always instituted by God, wherein He promises to do something that is either conditional upon the other party's obedience to a set of commands, or he promises to do something without any conditions needing to be met. He's going to make it happen. This is clearly seen whenever you read things in Scripture that say things like, do this and live. That's covenantal language. If you do this, it's the command, you will live. It's the covenant blessing. But if you don't do this, it's disobedience to the covenant, you will die. That's the covenant curse. That is covenantal language. Because it's God defining the terms of the relationship. We see this as early as the garden, don't we? You can turn a few chapters back with me if you'd like to chapter 1 of your Bible Genesis chapter 1. I want us to walk through a bit of redemptive history so that we can get a feel of the storyline of Scripture that leads us up to the Abrahamic covenant. You can look at chapter 1, verses 27, starting at verse 27. You know this story, but perhaps you've never noticed this language. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and the birds of the heavens, and so on. Verse 29, And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed and its fruit. You shall have them for food. That's very important. Look, Go to chapter 2. Look at verse 15. Putting these things together, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. That is covenantal 
language. Do this and live. Be fruitful, multiply, have all of the trees that you want, and you will live. And had Adam obeyed that command and held up his end of the bargain, you know what would happen today? You and I would be reaping covenant blessing. We would be fruitful. We would multiply. We'd have dominion over the earth. Things would go well with us. But what happened? Adam did not uphold his end of the bargain. So instead of covenant blessing, we have covenant cursing that came directly to Adam and we have inherited from him. We all live under that covenant covenant curse because Adam did not obey, so death came into the world. You and I are born this way. Every tree of the garden is yours. But if you eat of this tree, you're going to die. Adam was also to be fruitful and multiply and have dominion over all the earth. This covenant was established with the very first humans to ever live, and it shows us that even right from the beginning of human history, God deals with mankind in covenants. God initiates and establishes the terms of the relationship, and if you obey them, you live. If you disobey, you die. Covenant blessing, covenant cursing. So what happened in the garden? The same thing that always happens. Mankind was unfaithful in upholding our end of the bargain. Adam fell. Now all of creation is under the effects of sin. What do we find in Genesis 3? Isn't it God pronouncing curses? He's pronouncing the covenant curses on all of creation. But in the middle of those curses, look at chapter 3, verse 15. There is a promise. I will put enmity between you and the woman, speaking to the serpent, and between your offspring and her offspring, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This is known as the Proto-Evangelion or the Proto-Evangelium or in normal language, the first gospel. This is the first gospel that was ever preached to mankind. It is the gospel in seed form. How? The offspring that will bruise the head of the serpent, we know now is who? It's Christ Jesus. In the garden, God already proclaimed that He was going to send Christ Jesus. The offspring that will bruise the head of the serpent is Christ. He's going to defeat the powers of evil. I'd like to point out that God gave man the command to be fruitful and multiply, have lots of children and fill the earth. And perhaps we can see from God's design that God's desire is to save a multitude of people from all over the earth through this promised offspring. He wants you to be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth with the image of God so that one day, the earth can be filled with the knowledge of God. We can fast forward a few generations to chapter 9. We're going to find an unconditional covenant in the Noahic covenant. Chapter 9, verse 7. Hope you don't get a paper cut this morning. As you recall, God sent a flood to judge the earth and destroy it. And then look at what we find in chapter 9, verse 7. And you, be fruitful And multiply. And increase greatly on the earth and multiply in it. That sounds a lot like what he said to Adam, doesn't it? Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you. And with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the livestock, and every beast of the earth with you, as many as come out of the ark, it is for every beast of the earth. I establish my covenant with you. Never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. Now why do you think that is? If God wants to send this offspring that he promised in Genesis chapter 3, how can that happen if he has destroyed the whole earth? No, he, he commands mankind, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth with the image of God because I'm going to send an offspring who is going to fill the earth 
with the knowledge of God. Now, so far I've just been asserting that, but I want to show, we'll get there where I will show that to you. God sim- commits himself here in this unconditional covenant. There is no stipulation for mankind to obey. He simply says, I'm not going to do this anymore. I will never destroy the earth with water again. And there's nothing for mankind to do. He has established this covenant. It is unconditional. But in this, he has commanded man to be fruitful and multiply. Again, God's desire is to fill the earth with the image of God and send his promised offspring into the world and redeem it. Then we turn to Babel, Genesis 11. You find that mankind is once again not obeying what God commanded. Namely, they are not filling the earth and multiplying. Look at chapter 11, verse 4. This is the people of Babel. They have come together and they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens and let us make a name for ourselves. Look at what he says. Lest we be dispersed over the face of the earth. And then God speaking, verse 7, Come, let us go down there and confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth. And from there, the Lord dispersed them from over, all over the face of all the earth. Be fruitful and multiply. No. Yes, you will. Simple way of saying what just happened. We're not going to do that. We're going to come together. We're going to make a name for ourselves. And that's also very important. We're going to make a name for ourselves. We're not going to be dispersed over all the earth. We're going to come together right here. Some people point out that they're wanting to build a tower into the heavens. Maybe it's supposed to be flood proof. With every major story that we come across in the timeline of human history, we find that mankind is rebelling against God's purpose and breaking covenant with Him. But God is doing what He must do in order to ensure that His desire to fill the earth with His image will come to pass. But as I have said already a number of times, God's only goal is not just to fill the earth with humans the image of God. There's more. So many generations have now passed by the time we get to Abraham's story. But what we find is that God not only wants to fill the earth with the image of God, but also the knowledge of God. This is not new. This was always the plan. Adam was not supposed to sin. And had he not sinned, the whole earth would be filled with the image of God and the knowledge of God. We also see here in the Abrahamic covenant that God Himself will ensure that His mandate to man to be fruitful and multiply will be carried out and that His promised offspring from Genesis 3 indeed will come into the world. Do you see what He says to Abraham? Look at chapter 17 again. Let's look at verse 5. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations. Do you see how we often have the idea, and the Israelites certainly did, that the Abrahamic covenant was for Israel. I will make of you a great Nation, singular. But here, when God has now expanded and clarified the covenant, what does He say? Many nations will come from you. Many. In other words, the whole earth. People all over the earth are going to come from you. God is going to ensure that the earth is going to be filled with the image of of God, but most importantly, the knowledge of God. I want you to see the Abrahamic covenant contains both conditional and unconditional elements. We don't have time to do it this morning, 
but it would be a lot of fun. You can start reading in chapter 12. That's where Abram's story begins. That's where the covenant is first given to Abram. And then it's reiterated a few times, but most notably in chapter 15, and then here in chapter 17. But what happens in chapter 15 is that the covenant is ratified. So this is another element of covenant making in history that we have not dealt with yet. What happens in chapter 15 is that Abram, God tells him about the details of the covenant again, and Abram says, well, how am I supposed to know that this is going to come to pass? I don't have any children Abram was old as can be. He had no children and no hope of having children because he was old. Hebrews tells us that his body was as good as dead. He says, how am I going to have children? How am I supposed to know that this is going to come to pass? So what does God do? He tells him to go get some four-legged animals and some birds. He tells him to cut the four-legged animals in half set them by each other. And then a deep sleep falls over Abram. And God shows him this vision of a burning pot and a flaming torch that goes back and forth through those animals. And what this was signifying was this covenant is being ratified and guaranteed by God Himself. You see, in that culture, what would happen is that they would cut that animal in half. The two parties, if they were making covenant with one another, they would both walk through that animal. And they would say, may what happened to this animal, and worse, happen to me if I do not abide by the terms of this covenant. And in this covenant... Abram didn't walk through those animals. God did. God Himself is proclaiming in Genesis 15, may what happened to these animals and worse happen to me if I do not fulfill this covenant. Brothers and sisters, could Abram have been given any greater assurance? Because God cannot die. And God cannot lie. Abram has been given the ultimate assurance that God Himself would have to be able to die for this covenant not to be fulfilled. Which is impossible. One of the things that I think we often think about with God is that it's just really, really unlikely that He will fail. But what he is showing Abram here is that when he has covenanted himself to something, it is impossible for him to fail. Not just unlikely, not just probably not going to happen. It is impossible for him to fail. And Abram needed this assurance, just like you and I need that kind of assurance. When you get to chapter 17, though, it sounds like Abraham has to do something now. Look at verse 1. I am God Almighty, walk before me, be blameless, that I may make my covenant between you. That sounds conditional, doesn't it? Doesn't that sound like Abram has to be blameless and walk before God that way in order for God to establish his covenant? Then in verse 4, My covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of multitude. And your name's not Abram anymore, it's now Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. There's no condition there. God is saying, I'm going to do this. So which is it? Is it conditional or is it it unconditional? Well, as a lot of things in theology are, the answer is yes. The promise itself, God is going to fulfill the promise. But for Abram to enjoy the benefits of this covenant, he has conditions that he must abide by. It's not as though... Abraham could have lived in service to other gods and still have Yahweh, the only true living God, bless him. 
That would be absurd, wouldn't it? Thanks for that covenant blessing, God. I'm going to go serve Baal. No, that's not going to work that way. Abram has to obey God and follow God for him to be able to enjoy the benefits of being one of God's people. And so it is with the children who would come after him. They would have to obey in order to enjoy the covenant blessing and privileges. Now ultimately, if you think about what God is promising Abraham here, he's promised him land the land of Canaan. He's promised him people, a multitude of offspring. And he's also promised him kings. What does that sound like, if not a kingdom? God has promised Abraham that through Abraham, he was going to build his kingdom. Initially, of course, this was the kingdom of Israel. All of the 12 tribes of Israel descended from Abraham. Abraham gave birth to Isaac, who gave birth to Jacob, from whom all of the tribes come. In all of those 12 tribes, out of those 12 tribes, there was one royal tribe. Do you know what it was? Judah. The tribe of Judah was the royal line. Remember, God has promised you're going to have a bunch of offspring. Kings are going to come from you. He has 12 tribes of Israel. One of them is going to have kings that come from that line. God is fulfilling His promise in a natural sense. And all of this is going to come from a very old man who up to this point has no children. How would you have reacted if this promise was made to you? Would you have been like Sarah and fallen on the floor laughing hysterically? Which is a very interesting Interesting interaction, by the way. Sarah laughs, and the angel of the Lord says, Were you laughing? She says, No. He says, You were laughing. She says, Yeah. Yeah, I was laughing, because how ridiculous. We're so old. Have you seen Abraham try to get out of bed? He falls asleep in front of the TV at 4.30 in the evening. We don't have dinner anymore. We have supper. We have the discount at Luby's. We're old people here, guy. How do you think that we're going to have children? But God is not concerned with their physical situation because God has promised that He was going to do something. And if you read through the story, Abraham just gets older and older and older and older. But there's a very important verse that we have skipped over The Scriptures tell us in Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, that when Abraham received this promise, he believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. Though his body was as good as dead, as the writer of Hebrews tells us, Abraham still believed that God would keep his promise. But the promise was not just to give Abraham a lot of descendants and so fulfill God's desire to fill the earth with the image of God. Remember we said earlier, God's also going to fill the earth with the knowledge of God. Look at the text again in chapter 17, verse 8. I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojourning, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. You see, this gives us a hint about what kind of offspring Abraham is going to be given. They will be children who will have Yahweh as their God. They will be children who, just like Abraham, believe the Lord that it might be counted to them as righteousness. This is something that the Jewish people missed all throughout history and continue to miss today is that it has never been about this part of the covenant of circumcision. It has never been about being from the physical line of Abraham. As a matter of fact, did you know that in AD 70, all of Israel kept their genealogical records in the temple and they were destroyed in AD 70? There are no Israelites alive today who could trace their lineage back to Abraham. They can't do it today. So they don't even know if they're a child of promise anymore in a natural sense. 
None of them could say, I'm of the tribe of Benjamin or Issachar or of Naphtali. They can't do that today because the records have been destroyed. So it's never been about being from one of the tribes of Israel. It has always been about having faith like Abraham. Because even when Israel was a great nation state, even when Solomon and David and these great patriarchs were their king, not all Israel was Israel. Not every Jew was a true Jew. Not every child of Abraham was a true child of Abraham. Do you remember the interaction between Jesus and the Pharisees in John chapter 8 when he tells them just that? Well, we have Abraham for our father. What did Jesus say? No, you don't. Satan's your father. But they were from one of the tribes of Israel. How do we explain that? Well, that's going to lead us now into the next question. How does Christ fulfill the Abrahamic covenant? Go with me to Galatians chapter 3. We've already heard this this morning. Cliff read that for us. I want you to look at verse 16, Galatians 3, 16. And as you turn there, I'd like to give you just a bit of background regarding what's going on here in Galatians 3. It, it, the chapter opens up in the most epic way imaginable, very loving and tender. Paul says, oh, you foolish Galatians. How would you like that? What's happening is that the, if you're familiar with Galatians, it, Galatia was likely a mix of Gentiles and Jews who had been converted to Christianity. They had been founded by Paul. Uh, this church had been founded by Paul. It was his missionary journey. Founded this church. So he's deeply vested in what's going on there. Okay? What's happening is that Jews are coming in and they're teaching them, if you want to be a true person of the covenant of God, you have to obey the works of the law. Namely, you need to be circumcised. Remember, that was one of the conditions of the Abrahamic covenant. You needed to be circumcised in order for you to be counted as one of the people of God. And so Paul is writing and saying, you guys got it all wrong. You're being a fool. This is not what it's about. And Paul tells us what was the promise in the Abrahamic covenant. Look at verse 3, or verse 16 of chapter 3. I love this. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say unto offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring who is Christ. Christ is the answer. Christ is the promised serpent head crushing offspring of Genesis 3. Christ is the fulfillment of the promise made to Abraham to bless all of the nations through his offspring. Christ is the only one who would be able to keep covenant with God perfectly. Christ is the only one who would be able to bear the curse of our covenant breaking, thus bringing about covenant blessing. In Christ, the earth can now be filled with not just the image of God, but also the what? The knowledge of God. The fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant, my brothers and sisters, was not ultimately about the ethnic people of Israel, the Jews, or the geopolitical nation state of Israel. The ultimate fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant was always about Christ. The ultimate point of the Abrahamic covenant was not to give Israel a sliver of land in the Middle East, but to give the people of God the whole earth. Why? Again, so that the knowledge of God would, be, would fill the entire earth. God is going to ensure that His purpose prevails because mankind is entirely untrustworthy. Even the best among us. His plan cannot rest on our small shoulders or be entrusted to our feeble, shaky hands. So God sent the promised Christ to do 
what we could not do, that we might receive the blessing that we do not deserve, resulting in the glory and worship that God does deserve. Remember we mentioned from Genesis 15 that it was God himself who walked through those bisected pieces of the animals, thus indicating that it was going to be God himself who would fulfill the covenant. This is how he did it. He sent Christ, the offspring in whom all the nations are blessed. In fact, all of you who are in here this morning, who have trusted in Christ Jesus, you are all children of Abraham. The children of the covenant that God made with Abraham in Genesis. Look up at chapter, verse 7 in chapter 3. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. Not just one nation. It was never about this single nation. It's always been about filling the earth with the image of God and the knowledge of God. And the way that he would do that is by sending Christ so that all who look to Christ and believe in Him, God would count it to them as righteousness, just like He did for Abraham. You see how Paul says that the Scriptures preached the Gospel in Genesis 15? The Scriptures preached the Gospel beforehand to Abraham? Well, I thought the Gospel was in Matthew. I thought it started in the New Testament. It's not what Paul is telling us. Paul said, Abraham heard the gospel. Do you know who else says something like that? Jesus. Do you remember it? We read it in John. He said that Abraham saw his day, Christ's day, and rejoiced. And the Pharisees were incensed. They couldn't believe he was saying something so ridiculous. What are you talking about? Who even are you? It's always been about Christ Jesus. Go down to verse 26 of chapter 3. I'm sorry, read verse 9. So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Verse 26. For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male or female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. He's telling you in Wolf Earth, Texas in 2023 that you are an heir to the promise God made to Abraham if you have believed in Christ by faith. Can I just encourage you by saying that the ultimate interpreter of Scripture is not your favorite theologian, it's Scripture. When the Bible tells you what the Bible means, all of our theological systems, all of the things we grew up believing, all of the things that we thought were right, are all subordinate to that. When the Bible tells us in Galatians chapter 3 that this is what the purpose of the Abrahamic covenant was, do you know what we say? Oh, That's what the purpose of the Abrahamic covenant was. Paul is telling us that Christ fulfilled it. Oh, Paul is telling us that it's not about a nation state of Israel. It's about people trusting in Christ by faith. Oh, that's the answer. Imagine how complicated that is. When the Bible tells us what it means, the Bible is right and all of the rest of us are wrong. So when, well, you might say to that, 
What about the promise to make Abraham a great nation? 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. Speaking to Christians, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Listen, once you were not a people, once you were just a Gentile according to the flesh who was alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and you were not a part of the promises that were given to the people of God. But Christ has come. You were not a people at one time, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy if you are in Christ. Brothers and sisters, when Abraham was promised that a great nation would come from him, do you know who that great nation is? It's you. If you have trusted in Christ Jesus, you are a part of the holy nation that was promised to Abraham. Verse 9 again of chapter 3. Those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. And what is that blessing? That brings us to answer our final question, which is why does all this matter? I want to answer that question with three little points of application. It matters because it shows us that we are justified by faith alone. Look at verse 13 of chapter 3 of Galatians. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus, listen very carefully here, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles. What is that? So that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Though we were all in Adam and dead in Adam and under the covenant curse of death, Christ came and redeemed us from the curse by becoming a curse for us in his death on the cross. Christ bore our covenant curse as he was hanged on a tree. Cursed is everyone who was hanged on a tree. He did this so that we could now be under a new covenant where we no longer live under a covenant curse, but we now receive the covenant blessings because Christ perfectly fulfilled this covenant for us. The promise we share in with Abraham is that, just like Yahweh was the God of Abraham, He is now our God. Do you remember that promise in Genesis 17? I will be their God. If God is, Yahweh is your God, you have received the blessing of Abraham. The way that God accomplishes this is by sending us His Spirit that we receive by faith alone in Christ alone. Paul told us that the Scripture preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham. Abraham believed, and so God counted it to him as righteousness. Abraham was not righteous. He was far from it. He was likely an idol worshiper. But when he believed in God's promise, God counted that to him as righteousness. He was no longer under the covenant curse of death, but of the covenant blessing of life, which would later be secured by Christ's death on the cross. In the same way, When you and I heard the gospel and believed in God, we too came out from under the covenant curse of death and now stand in the new covenant where we receive all of the blessings along with Abraham of justification. But we also receive the promised Holy Spirit. How is it that Yahweh is our God as promised in Genesis 17? Because Emmanuel, God with us, came into the earth, and now God is in us. What an incredible covenant blessing. Secondly, 
It matters because it shows us how to read our Bibles. All of the promises of God are yes in Christ. I didn't make that up. The prosperity preacher didn't make that up. Paul said it in 2 Corinthians 1.20. All of the promises of God are yes in Christ Jesus. They all find their fulfillment and guarantee in Christ Jesus. When you come across a promise in the Old Testament that promises that God will be with you, that's not for the nation Israel. That is for you because you are a holy nation in Christ Jesus. He has secured it by His death on the cross. All of those promises are blood-bought and they belong to you if you are a people, a part of the people of God. Understanding the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant helps us to understand our Bible. There's not a part for Israel and Jews and a part for you. All of it is yours. Lastly, it matters because it shows us the faithfulness of God. I want you to think about how many thousands of years had passed before the covenant made with Abraham was fulfilled. Probably close to 2,000 years. Could you wait that long? You know, the writer of Hebrews in chapter 11 in the Hall of Faith, you know, now faith is the substance of things unseen. They give examples of faith. He ends up saying, none of these people received the promise that God gave them, but they believed. And it also tells us that Abraham understood that he wasn't looking for the land of Canaan. He was looking for a better city, one whose builder is God, a heavenly city, not the earthly Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem, the new heavens and the new earth where righteousness dwells. People waited for generation after generation for the promised Christ to come into the world and redeem them and fulfill the promises that God had made throughout the ages, waited and waited and waited. They waited for the serpent head crushing offspring to come and defeat the powers of evil. But not only that, think of how often God's people were found unfaithful. Even Abraham, when you read his story after God has Given him this promise of the covenant, what is Abraham doing? He goes to Egypt and says, Sarah, you're my wife. You're very beautiful. Pretend to be my sister so that Pharaoh will be nice to us. Does that sound like a righteous man? No. Then he also takes matters into his own hands and says, you know, we need to fulfill this covenant some way. Sarah says, why don't you take Hagar? Maybe God will fulfill the promise through Hagar. So he takes another wife, Hagar, and has a child and tries to make the promise happen himself. You've never done that, have you? You've never tried to take matters into your own hands, have you? Instead of just waiting on God. You see, in that moment, Abraham was faithless. The man of faith. He didn't trust God to fulfill this promise. But even still, there are moments in his life where faith shines forth brilliantly, like when he takes Isaac, the child of promise, onto Mount Moriah to sacrifice him. But no matter what, though we might be found faithless, God is always faithful. Brothers and sisters, cherish that truth. When you find a promise of God in the scriptures that does not seem to be fulfilled in your life, trust Him anyway, for He is a covenant-keeping, covenant-fulfilling God, and it is impossible for Him to fail. When you find scriptures that promise that He will be with you, and you look at your life, and everything seems like He's not with me right now, you can turn to Christ. And remember the faithfulness of God. That though it took generation after generation, God may not have been on time according to people, but He was not late. 
If He has sent the promised Christ, and if you are in that promised Christ, God will never let you go. He will never fail. He will never abandon you. And He will never cast out His family. For His own Son became a curse for you. So that in that Son, you might reap all of the covenant blessings meant for the people of God. When it seems like this isn't happening in your life, look to Christ and wait with hope on your covenant-keeping God.